On a Wednesday excursion, when I was a little girl, my father bought me a beaded wire ball that I loved. Its hinged wires traced the same pattern of intersecting circles that I had seen on the globe in my schoolroom, the thin black lines of latitude and longitude. As we strode up Fifth Avenue to Rockefeller Center with me on his shoulders, I remember we stopped to stare at the statue of Atlas, carrying heaven and earth on his. The bronze orb that Atlas held aloft, like the wire toy in my hands, was a see-through world defined by imaginary lines. Even as a child, I could recognize in the graph paper grid imposed on the globe, a powerful symbol of all the real lands and waters on the planet. Lines of latitude and longitude remain fixed as the world changes beneath them, with national boundaries repeatedly redrawn by war or peace. Any sailor worth his salt can gauge his latitude well enough by the length of the day or by the height of the sun. However, to learn one's longitude at sea, you need to know what time it is aboard ship and also the time at your home port. Every four minute difference between the two times indicates one degree east or west of longitude. This information so easily accessible today from any pair of cheap wristwatches was utterly unattainable during most of human history. On the 22nd of October, 1707, Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel summoned the captains of the British fleet to his flagship, the Association. That morning, he had ordered the execution of an able seaman. The navigation of His Majesty's ships is the sole concern of His Majesty's officers. The crime was keeping a private reckoning of the ship's position and publicly disputing the Admiral's calculation. Ball of bloody twine, every damned instrument in the possession of any seaman on any ship under my command, confiscated. Any further questioning of our position will be treated as an act of mutiny and dealt with accordingly. Is that clear? Now, by my reckoning, we are here, 30 miles off the coast of Brittany. Gentlemen, what are your figures? 30 miles from Romney, sir. Captain Ainsley? Uh, the same, sir. Where did the late able seaman Marston put us, Captain? Uh, here, sir. Ninety bloody miles away, <laughs> in the Isles of Scilly. <laughs> your vocal cords, you can speak, if you choose to. For God's sake, I'm not like the others out there. You're an officer in His Majesty's Navy. Four years' service, exemplary record. You're expected to set an example. Broken, I'm afraid. I keep meaning to get it fixed. Fiddly bloody things, aren't they? I think I'll stick to human beings. Honorable members.
members who mourned with us the recent tragic loss off the Scilly Islands of four of Her Majesty's ships and 2,000 wretched souls therein, under the command of Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, will be pleased to know that Her Majesty's government is to offer a reward. A prize of 20,000 pounds to any man offering a practicable and useful solution to the problem of finding longitude at sea. A board of longitude will be set up whose sole business will be to investigate any serious suggestion and finally it is profoundly to be hoped to award this prize. gentlemen. Much better. I'll see you all on Sunday. William, you wait here. What do you think, Sir Charles? Extraordinary. Could you hear the difference? Mr. Harrison, does it matter? The sound is beautiful. Could you spare me a moment, sir? Of course. It's not just beautiful, it's divine. That's where the beauty lies. Each note on the scale is calculated by a mathematical formula based on the circumference of a circle, you see. Uh, almost. The step between each note is composed of larger and lesser intervals, each derived from pi. It is divine because for the first time we are listening to music as the Lord intended. Cecil! Oh, leave him, darling. He's been in the car for ages. A long journey for a little boy. Cecil! Especially to look at a silly billy old clock. Oh! Is that my stable yard clock? Yes! It's being adjusted. Does it work, then? I have it to under five seconds a month. Oh, but that's absurd. Sir Charles, if we had funds to produce a small pamphlet, I've already prepared an outline of the text. Inexpensively printed, it could be made available to every village choir in the country. He showed it to an American gentleman last summer. He seemed rather disappointed when he saw it, as I recall. These partitions wouldn't have been here in Harrison's time, of course. But he probably did some work on the panelling. He was a carpenter by trade, you see. Yes, I know. This way. How can you tell if a clock is running five seconds faster or slower? My own pendulum clock is adjusted to one second a month. <laughs> no clock could be that accurate. Mine can. John? What's he doing? Good day, Mrs. Harrison. Charles? So Charles was asking about the choir. Where's William? Oh, dear. The pipe just touches the wheel, hardly using any energy. It's named after an insect, a grasshopper escapement. It's funny. It's 200 years old, built before Nelson was born. And can you see what it's made of? Wheel. Wood. It's made of wood. Darling, we're going to be late and Jocelyn's starving. If you close that door, I'll close this one. William? What did he say? He said he'd think about it. Is it accurate? Well, it wouldn't be then otherwise, would it now? No, I, I suppose not. It doesn't need oil, you see. The wooden bearings just lubricate themselves. You just wind it and walk away. Oh, 
Very good, bud. Thank you, sir. I just hope you're not thinking of giving up your regular work. I've got three farms to build this way. Yes. So it's not true what I hear about you wanting to build a clock that you can use at sea? Impossible, sir. Clock needs a pendulum. Can't take a pendulum to sea. I'd like you to say impossible, John. No, sir. So that's it. A wooden clock, that's his claim to fame. It's the first accurate clock ever built. That's certainly one claim. But not the most important, it's the sea clocks. They're the masterpieces. And where are they? John O'Groat? I don't know, I've, I've never seen them. Greenwich, I suppose. Am I keeping you awake? You are, not the music. You've made up your mind, haven't you? No. You mean you're not going? Not going where? To London. I didn't say that. You've found a way to build this sea clock, haven't you? With God's help, it might be possible. I mean, why did he encourage me to build a perfect timepiece in the first place? So the blacksmith might start work five seconds earlier or later. Or was it to give us? the ability to explore his creation in safety, to move without fear in the space he's given us to inhabit. London is no place for a boy. Don't worry, he's old enough, and he'll be company. Take James if it's company you need. No, I need James to stay here in the workshop if we're to meet. Besides, as for William, I'm doing all this. 20,000 pounds. He'll be gentleman. Does he need the money? <laughs> Precisely, a rocket would be fired 3,000 feet in the air from each barge moored at intervals of 10 miles. Thus! Did you say moored? Yes, sir. The Atlantic Ocean is no more than two leagues deep at any point. Sailors over distances of several miles would be able to observe the rocket at precisely midnight London time. And knowing both London time and the time aboard ship, uh, excuse me, may calculate their longitude position simply and safely. And how many of these barges do you propose? Um, 600, approximately. And who exactly is to fire these rockets? Her Majesty's Navy. Or, in time of war, patriotic citizenry. Anybody prepared, in fact, to live on a stationary barge in the middle of nowhere 365 days a year? And how exactly would these men be fed? Well, sir, the provisioning ships uh, would need to visit the barges on a regular basis. I think it went quite well. Now, it is vital to my process, Sir Edmund, that each dog be wounded with the same knife. As these three animals have been under my instructions some three days ago. Now, the animals are then to be conveyed aboard one of His Majesty's ships uh, under the supervision of a designated officer whose task it is to prevent the wound from healing. 
Uh, the knife, however, would remain here in London. And at precisely noon, each day is to be plunged into the powder of sympathy, which would immediately aggravate the wound so that each dog, no matter how many thousands of miles away he may be in his particular vessel, would begin to howl thus. Um, the navigational officer on board each ship would therefore know instantly that it would be midday in London and would thus be able to calculate his longitudinal position accordingly. Get rid of them. Dr. Halley, there's one further... No more today. I've had enough longitude lunatics for one afternoon. I'm sorry, sir. Don't touch that boy. I didn't, sir. Honest. I was just looking. Do you know what that is? It's still a moment of the stars. How do you know that? It's my job at home. You have one of these at home? No, sir. We use Mr. Johnson next door's chimney. And pray, what is it that you learn from Mr. Johnson next door's chimney? The time. How can you tell the time with the chimney? If you stand in the right place, you can see Sirius. Sirius? It moved behind Mr. Johnson's chimney three minutes and 56 seconds earlier every day. We need the time for our timepiece to tell if it's true. And is it? It's bloody perfect, sir. William. Go and find one. It's all right. I bought a torch. Who did you say you worked for? The hydrographer's office. Same as you. Well, if they were here, I'm sure I'd have known. Well, if they're nowhere else, it stands to reason. They must be here. Mr. Harrison, whatever the solution of the longitude, it will not be a timekeeper. George Graham's clock here at the observatory is the most accurate in Europe, yet it loses 33 seconds a month in the summer and gains as many in the winter. But I have two timekeepers at home, sir, accurate to one second a month that hold the same time, both summer and winter. How can you possibly tell? By celestial observation. No, of course, Mr. Johnson next door chimney. I hope to persuade the board, sir, that I will follow it. Now, do you know why? No, sir. Because we know the answer to the longitude problem. The stars, the only mechanism accurate enough for the purpose. When we have learned to map the heavens, we shall be able to chart the oceans beneath, and the longitude problem will be solved. Sir, so I have some papers with me. Do you know, Mr. Graham? No, sir. He's the finest instrument maker in Europe. If you indeed have a timekeeper as accurate as you maintain, he's the man you should talk to, not me. My secretary will write an introduction. A draw on the map, would you, Samuel? Yes. Goodbye, William. It's been a great pleasure making your acquaintance. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Harrison. Goodbye, sir. Excuse me. I'm looking for the Astronomer Royal's office. There seemed to be some confusion at the gate as to where he was. You found him. Things are still in a bit of a muddle, I'm afraid. We've had to store a lot of stuff. Is Sir Frank expecting you? Commander Gould, I have an appointment. Have a seat. I won't be a moment.
arm, but it must be wound no more than five turns every day. Uh, let that be the task of one man only. Mr. Graham, the work will be my own, I assure you. No one else shall touch it. Your ladyship is most gracious. Mr. Graham, do you wish to make a purchase, sir? Uh, no, sir. Then please uh, make your application to the door at the rear of the premises. I've been sent by Dr. Edmund Alley, sir. Mm, you better come in. Don't touch anything. Please. One second a month, sir. You know, a liar or a fool. Who are you makers? Myself and my brother James. Really? Who are you apprenticed to? My father. I'm a carpenter by profession, as was he. A carpenter? My timekeepers are made of wood. I brought some drawings with me. I'm sorry I mistook you. This is a joke, sir. Am I right? Mr. Halley seeks to derive some pleasure from this contrivance. Is he here, perhaps, hiding in a corner to watch my performance? As I am sorry, sir. The fault is mine. It was my impression. I was here to see a clockmaker. I found myself in a toy shop by mistake. William! Mr. Harrison. Summer and winter. How is it done? How is it done? The compensation. I use a pendulum of different metals that work against each other. Impossible. It doesn't work. I've tried it. It is possible. It does work. I've built it. Commander Gould, I have read your letter several times, in fact, and nowhere in it can I find any reference to any qualification for the work that you propose. Well, I'm a trained navigator, and I'm working on a history of the chronometer. I am referring to formal qualifications, Commander. The Harrison clocks are possibly the most valuable and certainly the most important timekeepers that we possess. Yes, I am aware that they have been neglected. And I suppose I must be grateful to you for pointing that out to us. However, there has been a war on. It is taking us a little time to sort ourselves out. Now, I believe that you are no longer on active service, Commander? No, sir, I'm retired. Yes. Admiral Douglas's office. It must be a quiet life, just staring at maps after your service on the China Seas. I had what is popularly known as a nervous breakdown. Quite. Sir Frank, I'm not asking to mechanically alter the Harrison machines. I just want to bring them back to their proper condition. If they're left as they are much longer, I fear they may become unrecoverable. I know my qualifications appear unlikely. I can only plead that they're no more so than Harrison's own. And I promise I won't fall to the floor and foam at the mouth. It was not my intention to make light of your condition. Nor mine. What about the Admiral? Has he agreed to this? Not exactly. I'd have to do it in my own time. Evenings, weekends, that sort of thing. There can be no question of payment. I seek none. to submit to the Board of Longitude. Mm -hmm. The Board is looking for a solution. I won't reward a theory. Besides, I'm not a mechanic among them. They're astronomers all. As far as they're concerned, the answer is in the heavens. Uh, may I? I'm a clockmaker, not a thief. Let me see your papers. You needn't be afraid. I'm no carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> We 
we've won no prize, but we will. Mr. George Graham's given us 200 pounds and to build my marine timepiece. Right, sir. Mm, yes, thank you. It is just under 200 years since John Harrison returned to Barrow with the money to start construction of his marine clock, which I shall call Harrison One. No. Graham's money was not enough to feed his family and pay for tools and materials, so he was forced to continue with his work as a carpenter alongside construction of the marine timepiece. Mark that. Thus, alone, without advice or assistance, Harrison set out to tackle a problem that had defeated every other craftsman on Earth. His solution to the pendulum problem was a new kind of mechanism that was not affected by exterior movement two balances that could compensate for any angle at which the clock was held. He also incorporated into the structure the temperature compensation techniques that he'd used on his wooden clocks. And he then began a rigorous program of comparison between the sea clock and his original regulating clock. Keep it steady, William. It's too close to the fire. That's nonsense. Now we have two enemies, the climate and the inclination of the oceans. We must be sure, as the piece is heated, be it by the Jamaican sun or by the fire, that the movement doesn't change. Is it cold enough in here? Yes. Uh, oh, that's good. Now, the rule set by the pendulum allows us to fix the motion to one twentieth of a second. Louder, James! Well, William. Four seconds. Four. So the sea clock is losing... A second an hour to the pendulum clock. I must keep making adjustments, make it perfect. Each adjustment of the new machine required that it be fully dismantled, which is an extremely demanding task. I am now able to achieve this in a little under eight hours, with the same time to be allowed again for reassembly. I have already had to do this four times. Harrison, when he was adjusting the clock, must have done it hundreds of times. Steady now. That's good. Keep it even. Steady now. 59. Start your count. Carefully now. 51. 52. 52. 53. 54. 55. 56. 57. 58. 59, 60. Stop! Stop, for God's sake, stop! Well, it's not constant. Well, it was still I could get under a second an hour. Now it's two seconds. That's 48 seconds a day. It's 48 seconds, so very much. On a seven-week voyage to the West Indies, that's over half an hour which would mean an error of nearly 500 miles. We can't afford to lose more than a second a week. Is it possible for a machine to be so accurate? John believes it is. There it is. Put a stop there. Keeps the lever from falling too far back. Commander! Good God, man, what are you doing here? I thought I was on my own. I'm going crazy! Oh. No, don't worry, not. That kind of crazy. It's this machine. There's not a straight line in it. It's layer upon layer of corrections, each one fitting on top of the other. Whenever he came across a problem, instead of going back to the beginning, he'd, he'd add another level of complexity. Springs working against levers, working against other springs and other levers. I mean, it's madness. Madness born of a refusal to be wrong. He couldn't just say, I've made a mistake. He'd say, I'll add something else, and it won't be a mistake. Look, can I get you something? I think I've got a bottle of sherry somewhere. Why don't you come and have a drink? No, it's all right. I'll, I'll just... I'll be right in a minute. 
Well, if you're sure. I thought about you today. I thought about the first time I saw you. You'd copied out a poem of Robert Graves. I don't remember which one. You'd drawn faces all around it. And I thought this is someone special. Not particularly because of the poem or the drawings. I don't know what I'm trying to say, really. It was a concentration, I think. There was so much noise going on around you and you paid no attention to anything except to what you were doing. And I thought, this is a man who can be anything he wants. What are you talking about? Nothing. I want you to give up the clock. I will. When it's finished. Yes, I knew you'd say that. Silly of me, really. He's ready. Can you see them? Out there. It should be less than a minute now. There's the stand, too. He looks happy. What happens now? London. And then the West Indies. If it's to win the prize. Oh, God. The machine moves with an elegance in every detail that I've never seen so far. Where every action is greeted by an equal and opposite one. Come, see for yourself. Be brave, sir. It's built to withstand the greatest storms ever faced at sea. I have myself tried with the utmost vigor to disturb the motions of the balances. It is incredible. And at sea, the clock will be housed in a protective casing which will also contribute to its stability. Mr. Harrison, it seems I misjudged you when we last met. And looking at it, I perceive that I must adjust the society's clock. <laughs> How can we help you? I wish to apply for a trial at sea. The Admiralty may order a sea trial. I will prepare a letter with the authority of the Royal Society. We will all sign it, testifying to what we have observed of your timepiece. Take it to the First Lord, and if you meet with success, be assured the Longitude Board will be assembled. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Board of Longitude has three elements. Academics, sailors, and politicians. Now, you've met most of the academics at the Royal Society, and they support if you can convince the Admiralty, then you have two-thirds. That only leaves the politician. Mr. John Harrison. Good luck. Thank you. But remember, this is the Navy. <laughs>
Yes, I wish we, we should have to order them all back. <coughs> Who the bloody hell is that? Oh, oh. Well? My lord, I come to humbly beseech you that you see fit to send my machine for determination of the longitude for trial at sea. Other ears, other ear. Bloody Spaniard did that to me. Bloody useless ever since what? It is specified by Act of Parliament that such a trial should take place on a voyage to the West Indies. This is my petition to your lordship. Mm. You a seafaring man, sir? No, sir. Pity. What? Well, I have the certificate of your mathematical friends at the Royal Society, Mr. Harrison, but I am no scientist. May I ask a simple question of you? Yes, sir. Will your machine keep its time at sea? Yes, sir. I believe it will. I have seen men die where they should not too often not to pray success for your endeavor. God's blood. It's an improvement on sticking a knife in a damn dog. Well, <laughs> get me the Portsmouth list. I cannot promise you the West Indies, but we'll find you a ship. John, I do not ask you to be a politician. God forbid, but you must not assume that every man is your enemy. But why Lisbon? The act of Queen Anne says the trial must be for the West Indies. Be patient. Journey is short. You'll be back in less than a month if you're lucky. And if the machine performs, the board will have to order a further trial. Have you been to sea before? No. You've never been out of a quick voyage. First time, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison requests permission to come aboard. Permission grant. Good. I'll catch him. Steady, sir. Mr. Harrison. Lieutenant Bertie. Lieutenant. Captain Proctor presents his compliments and advises you to stow your machine in the great cabin. Has he seen it yet? I don't think so. Good. God. Steady there. Please ask your men to be careful, Lieutenant. Oh, Mr. Harrison, this is the Navy. Steady there. Get that whip off her. Campbell, take Mr. Harrison to the great cabin with his clock while I report to the captain. Aye, aye, sir. This, sir, is the so-called great cabin, Captain Proctor's private quarters. That's where he sleeps, and in there's where he eats his supper. Smaller than I imagine. Aye, and it'll be smaller still with your machine inside it. Eh? Machine won't fit. Case is too large. Don't worry, sir. This is a fighting ship, not a common inn. Gentlemen, will you give me action stations? Aye, aye. Mr. Harrison, you don't need a drawing room when you're fighting a battle. Prepare to receive the Admiral's signal. Got to stand by, sir. Done. I don't know. Loose the mizzen topsail. Loose the mizzen topsail, Mr. Sprague! Aye, aye, sir. 
Give a bit more fire. Not unless the French declare war. Which isn't good to happen next week. This is the berth deck where the crew sleep and eat. The wardroom where you'll be quartered is just above us. And don't pay any attention to what you've heard about Navy food. This is a short voyage and we've plenty of fresh provision aboard. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Harrison. Make sure you look after him now. This is Ned and Seth. Hi, sir. Hi, sir. One hammock, quite comfortable with a bit of practice, and your very own nine-pounder. Whose quarters are these? Oh, don't worry about Lieutenant Draper. It's a short trip, but me and Lieutenant Berti are on different watches. I'm afraid you must excuse me, but I should go back on deck. The air here is... Poisonous. You'll get used to it. Most people don't notice it after the first couple of years. Darling, is that you? Yeah. Why are you waking the children? Mm -hmm. You've woken Laura. I'm sorry, Miss Guy. No, I'm all right. Night, everyone. I know you don't like having a lodger, but we don't exactly have much choice at the moment, do we? I suppose we don't. I'm going to bed. Make sure you turn out the lights. Good night. Captain in the wardrobe. Relax, gentlemen. I came to see that our guest was comfortable. Mr. Harrison chose not to die this evening, sir. His stomach did the choosing. We'll keep an eye on him, Lieutenant Draper. The Admiral won't be too pleased if we lose him. I tried to take a reading from his machine this evening and plotted a position that had us sailing through the city of Corona. <laughs> <laughs> brought you a little broth. It'll help ease your stomach. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. <coughs> Mr. Campbell. You do me a little kindness. My machine holds to London time, which is different from the time aboard the ship. I need to have a reading of the clock at ship's midday precisely. Can you do that for me? Nice, sir. <laughs> I'm not much of a sailor, I'm afraid. Oh, how long have you been at sea? Four years. Well, for God's sake, why? I was pressed. That was my own decision. I was apprentice to the master of a cutter out by Argyle. We'd heard there was an English frigate pressing men farther south, but we didn't expect to find them anywhere near us. Yeah. What happened? We gave them a good run, but they caught us in the end. They had twice the canvas. They took every man except myself and the master. We two were supposed to get it back to port. But you didn't. The first mate was a good friend of mine. He'd been married two weeks before. He was in a terrible way. I offered to take his place. All hands! Try and finish your broth. I'm no matter, Mr. Harrison. I was young. I didn't want to spend my whole life on a cutter. Sir Charles, I must thank you for your help with Mr. Harrison's machine. Mr. Halley, if your machine can do what its maker claims, then I will make you a promise. Within 12 months, His Majesty's Navy 
will control the high seas. No one will move on water without our permission. I'm not sure that is quite what he has in mind. Who cares what is in the man's mind? Very little, except the ticking of his damn clock was my impression. But if he gives us the power to navigate the ocean without holding on to each other's coattails like blind men in a brothel, I'd give him 20,000 pounds a year! What? I apologize for my behaviour, sir. There's not a man among us who hasn't felt like you have, sir. No apology required. How's your machine? I need to take some more readings before we arrive in Lisbon. You've got two days by my reckoning. Thank you, sir. Excuse me. I think I preferred him when he was sick. <laughs> No good. I still have us 20 miles inland. Check again. I have. Look, my reading on the first day was close to Proctor's. For the last two days, my clock has lost two seconds, three seconds, maybe four. But according to the map, we've lost four minutes or more. Map must be wrong. We sighted Cape Finisterre this morning. The map is true. I'm writing a report to the Admiralty about your machine. They wish to know if the voyage has been a success. I'm not entirely sure what to say. I cannot tell till I get back to London and compare it with my pendulum clock. I suppose you think I'm a bloody fool. Well, don't worry, I'm used to it. But I know a little navigation and I can read the time on your machine. It's not showing the true longitude. You do realize that, don't you? Yes. Now, do you know why it isn't working? Something's happened to the machine. Some kind of accident while I was ill. You mean it stopped? I'm not sure. Perhaps. I'm over four minutes slow. Yet while I've been with the machine these last three days, I'm certain it kept true time. That is indeed remarkable. Well, we must tell the Admiralty then to wait till you get back to London, then, mustn't we? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent time. No sign of the dolphin who left two days before you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> who is that? Admiral Sir John Bolton. Hello. Not a man I'd wish to sail with. The ships have a habit of being captured. Maybe because they're usually weighed down with wine and tobacco. What the bloody hell is that? It's a timepiece, sir. Ah, the carpenter's clock. I'm supposed to take charge of its return. Admiral Wager's instruction. <laughs> Does it work? Mr. Harrison says he won't know till he's back in London. What a monster. I certainly don't intend to have it in my cabin. And I doubt if any of my captains will want it either. 
What do you think, Lieutenant? Put it on the orphan, sir. Hmm? Captain Mann won't notice it's there. He will. If it's in his bloody cabin. <laughs> Get up, Tom. Well, the accent needs a bit of work, but you seem happy to be on dry land again. I've decided what to do. I'll take a sighting here in Lisbon and calculate Lisbon time on the boy's back. So you can start with a clean slate? I've purchased my own chart, so that I may make my own record of observation. The wording's in French, I'm afraid, but it looks fair enough. Well, I wish you every success on the offer. Looks like you'll get better weather anyway. The best for all. Coming through! Mr. Harrison, my orders are the all up deck aft with the other stores. Or it cannot go down there. I need more light, room for it to move, and easy access to the deck. Sir, this is a very crowded ship. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Do you know anything bloody rude in Portuguese? Uh, no, sir, I'm afraid I don't. Pity. Norvler, Lieutenant. John Anderson. How do you do? I don't know where you're going to sleep. We're pretty full. I'll bring my machine down here. That's the gun deck. I need space and light. There's no one else. Besides, the center of the ships would give it an easier passage. If you'll excuse me, Mr. Harrison, I am rather occupied at the present. Oh, person, stop Come on now, you must get down from there. Mr. Harrison? Yes. Who's a joiner? Well, the case is my own work, if that's your question. Arthur Mason, ship's carpenter. Pleased to make an acquaintance. My man will take this for you when he want it. Thank you. Below on the gun deck by the mainmast. Don't worry. We'll look after it. Thank you, Lieutenant. Give me your arm a moment, will you? You asked Mr. Wills to attend me in my cabin. The Admiral expects to weigh anchor on the evening tide. Very good, sir. Get the chair straight away. Sharp. Aye, aye, sir. Lieutenant Norvler, was the port wine loaded according to my instructions? Uh, 70 cases, sir. All accounted for. Good, good. Mr. Wills! What the damned hell is that? Mr. Harrison. We got a signal from Admiral Bolt. The bloody carpenter. I'll kindly give him my compliments and inform him that if he's going to wave that octant around on my ship, he can confine himself to the forecastle, where he may be less disturbing to members of the crew. Get on with it, man. Yes, sir. Mr. Harrison. Don't worry, Lieutenant. I, uh, I'm finished for now, anyway.
What's the matter, Josh Killick? Didn't you never see the clock before? What's he doing here? It's a marine timepiece. Navigation device. Help you get home. <laughs> How are you gonna navigate down here in the bloody dark, eh? <laughs> <laughs> because I can find where we are by knowing the time. Yeah? How's that? There's only one sun. Cannot be in two places at the same time. When it's dark on one side of the globe, it's light on the other. The sun passes over a given point once every 24 hours. If we can find out how long it takes the sun to get from Jamaica to Portsmouth, it's simple to work out the distance between the two. So where are we then? We're here. Boatswain's mate, I want all these hammocks slung. Hammocks up! Come on! Hammocks up! Your machine is a disturbance to the men, Mr. Harrison. It'll have to go. I'm not intending to disturb anyone, Lieutenant. Good. Will he be finishing soon, sir? And I have to lock up, you see. Hmm. Of course, yes. No, I'm I'm finished for the day. So, uh, what time is it exactly? Well, it's past midnight. Oh dear. Do you know how to rid your bread of maggots? No, sir. You take a piece of rotten meat and you place the bread on top of the meat and count to three whilst you've got some maggots. Leave the bread for the meat and you pick up the bread and swallow it fast before the little buggers can change their mind. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I understand you're keeping a chart, Mr. Harris. I am. Perhaps you'd be kind enough to let me see it in the morning. Certainly. Come in. I tried not to wake anybody. Rupert, how long is this going to go on for? You know what I'm talking about. Do you remember when we used to discuss you becoming a lawyer, studying at the bar and all that? That was when I'd finished the clock. That was when the clock was a few weekends. Not the unpaid work of a lifetime. Destroying us. No, it isn't. Well, it is me. I brought you a piece of fish. No, thanks. Don't worry, I caught it myself this morning. Tell me uh, what you want to hear. Uh, makes no sense. Huh? According to this, we aren't headed for England at all, but for the Americas. Well, we sail in west, that's for sure. The wind's against us, so Balkan's taking us west in the hope that we'll pick up something that'll take us back up the channel. So maybe you are not so far out. This isn't a bloody coracle, you know. You can't turn the British fleet around on the far end. Thank you for 
On the 18th, we were at 8 degrees 47. I have 9 degrees 2. And yesterday? 6 degrees 10. And then you're about 53, 54 miles west of us. How can you be so sure? I can't, Mr. Harrison. Not till I see land. But I know these waters well. I don't think I'm wrong. There it is. Start point. I have it. Mr. Wills, can you show me from the map where we are? Here, sir. We'll see the berry head just there in a moment. Mr. Wills, according to my calculations, we're here. That is the Lizard Rock. We say on this course, it's Dodman's Point we'll be seeing. No, sir. Sir, I've slipped by my machine for 30 days, taking a reading from it every six hours. I am not mistaken. Mr. Harrison, did you ever see Dobman's Point? No, sir, I did not. Well, pray God you never will in a southeasterly like this, or that site will be your last. That is the Blackstone. What do you mean that site will be my last? You were right, Mr. Harrison. We are passing up through the manacles with the wind in the southeast. We shall be smashed to pieces. Mr. Harrison, that was the Lizard Point, Mr. Wills. And over there is Dodman's Point. I saved my life on it. What's he saying? That is Dodman's Point. You're 60 miles west. Lieutenant Stewart, escort Mr. Harrison below and confine him there until further orders. Excuse me, sir. It's a gallant look Harry Paul's Edison on the starboard bow. I have it. It's the Edison, all right. Sorry, we must signal the Admiral. The Admiral is closer than we are. If he can't see our position, who am I to suggest otherwise? Our orders are to keep station. Sir, we have very little time. I can signal the master of the Princess Amelia. Gentlemen, I am going below. Lieutenant Norvler, take charge. Aye, sir. Send this signal to the Princess Amelia immediately. What are they doing? Can't change course without an order from the Admiral. But how can they warn him? Cannon, Mr. Harrison. And we'll have to reply. Mr. Stewart, prepare to put her about. Cannon. Better get below. Bolson Pipe Action Station have the gun and stand by to fire 15 rounds. Clear the point against this wind. We'll take some time, but we will. We have to. Starson, congratulations! <laughs> Boatswain's mate, all hands on deck. Need every man at his station. 
We all have you to thank for our lives, Mr. Harrison. Congratulations, sir. Thank you. Hi, sir. Mr. Franklin. No, he isn't. What's the matter? Nothing. Don't worry. Good God, man. What's the matter? Come with me. sitting here staring at them. Hardly daring to breathe. That is incredible. Completely utterly incredible. Is everybody all right? I'm very all right. Is this it? Take a look at my entry to the log for the second. You will see that it reads that Admiral Balkan fired 15 guns, ordering the fleet to disperse to their destination, which they did in an orderly fashion after giving an answering signal. That isn't true. Yes, I'm showing you this so that you will not suffer from any confusion at a later point. I've also written to the Admiral and informed him of my intention to resign from the service. He has kindly indicated today that he will recommend my appointment as a captain at Greenwich Hospital, a position that I shall be honoured to accept. Trust this makes things clear between us. So yesterday never happened. Our orders are to proceed to Chatham. You may disembark there and take your machine back to London. Is that clear? Perfectly clear. machine with my pendulum clock. It has lost six minutes and four seconds since I left London. Yet the journey back from Lisbon took 32 days, and I believe it kept near perfect time. Something happened on the Centurion, something I don't understand. Well, you need another trial. No, no, I need time. Time to think. Time to test it again, but not at sea. It's too big. I realize that now. The act of Queen Anne demands a practical solution. It's impossible. The machine is perfect. You should have seen the people who came in the shop today to see it. The test was useless. I have no proof. No one will believe me. The machine is impressive, Mr. Harrison, and you assure us that on the Lisbon test it performed well. Yes, sir. But you have no documentary evidence for that. No, sir, I do not. But I'm not asking for the no test. No copy of the ship's log. No certificate from the ship's captain. If the machine performed as well as you suggest, does that not seem to you a little strange? I understand that there is no proof, but... Mr. Bradley, the Admiralty has had some difficulty in obtaining Captain Proctor's papers. Since his untimely death in Lisbon in October, Captain Mann, as we've already discussed, failed to report the timepiece in his log. This, this is why we're discussing a further test. My Lord, is it wise to squander our resources on a second test when there is no clear evidence for the success of the first? Particularly when other research... Sir Edmund Halley's lunar observations, for example, is proving very successful. Mr. Harrison, are you prepared for such a test? No, sir, I am not. Ah, my point, I think, gentlemen, the machine is no good. The machine is good. I've tested it myself day and night in my workshop since my return under the most extreme conditions. 
but I intend to produce a better. However, I must ask for additional funding. I beg the indulgence of your lordships in this matter, but I can assure you that since my voyage, there's no man on earth more eager to solve this problem than myself. Mr. Harrison, we do not doubt your enthusiasm, but it is not the business of the board to speculate upon it. Excuse me, sir. I'm seeking the board of longitude. Never heard of it, sir. This is the Admiralty. Uh, it's their first meeting today. It is, I believe, in the boardroom. The boardroom? Oh, why didn't you say so? You're looking at it. Oblige you, sir. Lord, I beg leave to approach. If it pertains to the matters we're discussing. Indeed it does, my lord. I have in my hand a certificate from one Roger Wills. Lately, master of his majesty's ship, the orphan. May I read? Yes, 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 very well. Oh, excuse me. I haven't run so far since I was a child. Refreshments for the gentleman. Uh, no, my lord. Thank you, my lord. This is the passage. When we made the land, according to my reckoning on others, it ought to have been the start. But John Harrison declared to me and the rest of the ship's company that according to his machine, it ought to be the lizard, the which, indeed, it was found to be. His observation showing the ship to be more west than my reckoning above one degree and 26 miles. Lord, I trust this will assist you in your deliberations. Mr. Wills is present, if you should require further confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Harrison, would you excuse us for a moment? Thank you. Thank you very much. I couldn't sit right with my conscience that a lie stand in the way of your machine. Not when it may do some good for poor sailors like myself. 500 pounds. Half now, yeah, half when the second clock is complete. There's something to be set against any future prize winning. George tried for more, but they wouldn't have it. No. At least you may go home now with some money in your pocket. I'm not going home. I'm going to take a place here in London. Got to work fast. Your family? They'll have to come with me. Good news, if that is the term for it, is that Mrs. Gould will be unable to get a divorce unless she can prove adultery. I might take it this is not the case. No, it is not. Then she has only one alternative, and that is to seek a judicial separation. That would mean an order from the court that you are to live separately, even though you are still technically married and therefore unable to consider remarriage. Well, I don't think Muriel wants to get remarried. Quite. Lacking adultery, she will have to cite mental cruelty. Do you know what that means? I can guess. Allow me to explain it to you clearly. It will be necessary for her to make certain allegations in open court. These allegations may subsequently be reported in the newspapers. There's nothing we can do to stop that. If we are to proceed, we must consider the consequences of this. I don't understand. Why would the newspapers be interested in me? <laughs> well, they aren't. But a wife suing a husband is uncommon enough, I'm afraid, to arouse their curiosity. Now, I'm, I have been sent several statements from your wife's solicitors, and they're very detailed indeed about your alleged drinking, the instability of your mind, and your character. I see. Commander, it is my duty to inform you that you stand to lose your children, your house, your reputation, and quite probably your job if you both continue in this action. Well, thank you, Mr. Worthington. You made things very clear. Thank you for your advice. I wonder, do you think Muriel understands all this? I'm sure Mrs. Gould is competently advised. Yes, of course. I'm sure she is. Thank you. 
There's two bedrooms, small attic room, and this is the sitting room. I see that the machine has already chosen its quarters. The money the board has given is to pay for a new timepiece. Not much left for us, I'm afraid. It's the best I could do. How long? Two years at most. And then we go home? Then we go home. Right. Let's get started, then. Do you have a cake? Yeah, thank you. Oh, I've got some pictures for you that Cecil drew. Mm -hmm. My God, I can't find them. I've forgotten them. Y you will mention them to him, won't you? One with them was off a boat, and the other, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'll post them. But do be sure to say something. <clears throat> what time's your train? Ten to. Finish the first one. First one? Look, it's so beautiful. I wish you'd come and see it. I think they're going to let me work on the second one now. That'll be harder, of course. It's, it's, it's smaller and more compact. I'm so sorry. Just I don't know what to say. Hallie had lived to see this. He understood your work. The Earl of Macclesfield fills the board with astronomers, confident the lunar method will win. I don't have much sympathy with us poor mechanicals, I'm afraid. I don't need sympathy. Maybe you don't. You do need money. This machine is a success. It is my intention to propose that the Society award you the Copley Medal. It's the highest honor. Did you bring the record of your new tests? I have them, yes. But they mean nothing. Enough. The results are spectacular. I've seen them myself. There was a fault. What do you mean, a fault? In the machine. The fault was in the first machine as well, but I didn't understand. I found it by accident. Something that could never have been discovered with the testing at sea. Luke. Stop! What are you doing, you mad? That's not the motion of a ship. Centrifugal movement. It slows the clock down. That was exaggerated. When a ship turns or changes course, centrifugal movement causes the machine to lose a fraction of a second on a long voyage. That'll mean minutes. Then uh, make an adjustment in the cradle. Oh, the cradle will make no difference. I've already started a new machine with different balances, George. That's circular. Harrison's second machine was mechanically a replica of his first with some improvements in detail. However, it was more compact. The main concern being to create a machine that could be managed more practically. But it was never to be tested at sea. The problem of centrifugal force caused by the pitching and yawing of a ship appeared to be insoluble. On no account comment on any of his machines or display any interest in them. He'll be convinced that you're trying to steal an idea from him. Keep your eyes on the floor at all times. Did you bring a sample? Oh, yes, Mr. Graham. Three pocket watches as you instructed and a model of a clock escape. Uh, he won't be interested in the watches, but he should get an idea of the quality of your work. It is a beautiful piece of work, is it not? Mm. It's interesting, although I think there's a little too much tension in the mainspring. But the workmanship is fair. Mr. Jeffries has worked for me for over 12 years on every kind of matter. 
I can assure you he will make a most excellent and diligent assistant. Oh, I don't need an assistant. My son will be my assistant when he's old enough. John, you need some help now. You know you do. Yeah. Mr. Jeffries, it's an honor to meet your acquaintance. As it happens, you may be able to oblige me. I'm in need of a pocket watch. I would be honored. Very good. It must be suitable for use in different climates. I'd need you to make some particular alterations. If you wouldn't mind looking through these drawings. I'll do my best to give satisfaction. I needed to carry time from my regulating clock in the captain's cabin to the deck where the observations are made. Anything you don't understand, come back and see me. Now, thank you very much for coming over here, George, but now I have work to do. Uh, goodbye, George. Thank you, George. Why would you not let them see anything? There's nothing for them to see. I have no solution. I failed. So what will you do? I think perhaps we should go home. Don't say that if you don't mean it. Please don't. Frank's expecting it. Yes, of course. Just one moment. Commander Gord is here to see you. You can go in now. There it is. Very nasty. I don't know what business the newspapers have to interfere. Nothing like other people's misery to cheer up your morning. Quite. I hear you've resigned from the Hydrographer's office. No. I was sacked, as a matter of fact. I think Admiral Douglas was pleased to have the excuse. Oh, dear. I'm very sorry to hear that. Very sorry. But perhaps the opportunity to rest will do you good? I've tidied up H2. It's in... Pretty good order. I thought that under the circumstances you'd be happier if I didn't continue to work on it. Yes, well, perhaps that would be for the best. If it would suit you too. Well, thanks for dropping by. I really am very sorry. Gentlemen, I am most pleased to announce the presentation of the Prize Medal of Gold, annually bestowed by this society, to Mr. John Harrison of Orange Street, Red Lion Square, in consideration of those very curious instruments invented and made by him for the exact measurement of time. Honorable members. Uh, honorable sit members. down, John. It's not your turn yet. <laughs> I call upon Sir Martin Fuchs uh, to give an account of Mr. Harrison's achievements. I need this medal, John, if your work is to continue. Just smile. It's all we need. Harrison, 
I must congratulate you on your services to horology. Your machines are truly masterpieces. As for the longitude, well, you came close. But I think you must admit that the matter is now best left with the astronomers. Would you like some wine? Yes, I think I would. Mr. Partner, do we have any wine? No, madam. Oh, dear. I'm afraid you'll find us rather dull after London. Would you like some sherry? No, thank you. Perhaps a whiskey after dinner. Oh, have some now, dear. Mr. Partner, a little whiskey for Rupert. So, dear. Have you thought what you're going to do? No, Mother. No, I haven't. Sorry to call so late. John! It took me a long time to find you. What's happened to you? Did you not hear about us then? You stayed on the Centurion. Aye, I'm a lieutenant now. Sailed around the world with Lord Anson. I'm a rich man. My share from the capture of the Hacienda was 217 pounds. Oh, so this is the new one. I heard that you were building another. Oh, sit down. Can I get you something? No, thank you. I sailed in the company of 961 men, sir. 203 returned to England. Of the 760 who died, only 48 were killed by enemy action. And the rest? Disease. Despair. We were lost. Weeks on end without sight of land, fresh food, water. Although much of the time we were within six hours sailing of Juan Fernandez, but we'd mistook our position. Didn't know it. I saw more men die than any Roman emperor. Men who you'll remember, and who remembered you. John Sprague, Lieutenant Draper, the mess boys, Ned and Seth. Didn't even make 14. We all heard about the Orford and how your machine performed as we sailed hopelessly on heaving man after man over the side. Have you seen a man die of scurvy? No, I haven't. The body starts to swell like a balloon. Legs are the worst, so that every movement causes pain. Then the skin starts to split, horrible bleeding gashes. Your tongue grows in your mouth. And the throat swells so that eating and drinking impossible. Death is a release. I thought only of one thing. A piece of twisted brass spinning. There, look. Its little heart still beating. I thought to myself, this will never happen again. There'll be a machine to tell us where we are. I swore that if I lived, I'd come and find you. John, when they were dying, who did your men curse for their misfortune? Their god, or their admiral. When you're afloat, there's little difference. And if there's a clock, and the clock didn't work, and the men still died, who would they curse then? When you're young, you think that anything is possible. But as you grow older, you discover that it isn't. Well, then don't grow older, Mr. Harrison.
I thought that was supposed to be for Cecil. It bores him, I think. Don't worry, he'll grow into it. Partner needs to set the table. Perhaps we'd better take it to the attic just for now. There's plenty of space up there. All right. Excuse me, Reverend Maskell, and I shall have to let them in. May I have one minute, Dr. Bliss? Most certainly. What are you going to do about your precious clocks? Well... I'm giving a talk to the Horological Society. For money? Of course not. You can't just sit around here for the rest of your life, you know. I do know. May I make a suggestion? Mm hmm Admiral Douglas had no right to stop your work. It was all that publicity about your divorce that gave him the chance. If you brought the matter to the attention of the Navy Board yourself, he would have no legal argument. You're saying that I should write to them? Write to Douglas first, hinting that you might, but um, giving him the opportunity to um, change his mind. But that would be blackmail. Precisely. I think that's rummy. Thus, Dr. Meyer's lunar tables allow the navigator to calculate his longitude at sea, making allowances for both refraction and parallax distortion, using simple trigonometry. They suggest that the longitude problem is finally to be solved by a clock, not a clumsy man-made device of spinning wheels and levers, but a celestial clock whose hands are the moon and whose numerals are the stars. A dial writ across the sky by the creator himself. But you might have been a lunatic and a serious one. Very good. Terribly good. Thank you. My Lord Sandwich. Morton, you honor the society. I had thought you might be attending the opera again tonight. No, my lord, but rest assured, the opera will be visiting me. Congratulations, sir. Most interesting. Thank you, Your Lordship. The longitude prize is yours, then. My lord, I am, I hope, a scientist. Knowledge itself is my reward. Oh, very Mark. good. He has ability, that young man, but little sense. How long will it take to prove these tables? Oh, not so long, four years, perhaps. Can he beat the old carpenter? He has lost his way. His third machine has defeated him. Or so the rumor has it. This society was created so that men of science might solve the mysteries of our planet. I would not wish to see the longitude prize stolen by a country toolmaker. Did you find the paper of interest, Mr. Harrison? Well, I certainly enjoyed the Reverend's enthusiasm for trigonometry at sea. My lord, the moon may only be observed 20 days in every month. And then only when there is no cloud. It is not a practical solution for navigation at sea. Please forgive my son William, you know. But he is right, Mr. Harrison. The practical solution is what we all see. Mm. Tell me, the society's clock, is it still adjusted by celestial observation? I believe it is, sir. Why is your watch wrong? No, my lord. It's almost right. Which is much more curious, don't you agree? William? Lord? Four seconds. Still no change, then. It's remarkable. Mr. Harrison, you asked to see me. Ah, Mr. Jeffries. I was hoping you might be able to do some work for me. I would be delighted. Could you make me one of these? I need the teeth to be set a little further apart. I have to do a sketch of the details. Yes, yes, that should be possible. Uh, would next week be acceptable? Oh, yes, yes, of course. 
Thank you. Oh, Mr. Jeffries, your watch. Is there a problem, Mr. Harrison? No, no, I'm quite pleased with it. The modifications are encouraging. I want to make another. Must be a little larger, of course, to incorporate some more changes I have in mind. And I was wondering if you would consider assisting me. I would be happy to. Thank you, Mr. Jeffries. See you next week. What are you doing? I mean to make another. But the third is almost ready. We cannot afford to be distracted now. You've seen how the watch has performed in the test. It's not perfect. But what if I could make it so? What if I could make a timepiece no bigger than the span of a man's hand that could be taken to see? Now, wouldn't that be a practical solution? Harrison's fourth machine, by reason alike of its beauty and its accuracy, must take pride of place as the most famous chronometer that ever has been or ever will be made. But the journey from his third machine, which you see behind me, to his fourth, thank you, is one of the most extraordinary mysteries of horology. Faced as he was by a seemingly insuperable problem of centrifugal forces, Harrison took a daring and lateral leap. It is as though an aeronautical engineer suddenly ceased development on a new aircraft and instead adapted the technology to make his bicycle fly to France. H4, as I've come to call it, resembles a large silver pair case watch, about five inches in diameter. Indeed, it seems to have been designed for the daily wear in the pocket of some Brobdingnagian. At the moment, it's not working. But that is a state of affairs that I hope very shortly to do something about. We should be finishing work on our third machine, not wasting time on this deck watch. Wasting our time? The machine is almost ready for its sea trial. And we've not had time to conduct a 28-day test on this watch, let alone three or six-month trial. I'll go when I'm ready, another four. Then we need to apply for more money. We cannot survive any longer than what we have. Mr. Jeffries at least should be paid, even if we are not. Are you unhappy, Mr. Jeffries? Me, sir? No, sir. There you see. Mr. Gould. Sir. Francis Gray. I enjoyed your talk very much. Oh, I'm looking for people who can explain science in language that anybody can understand. Children, for example. Do you have any of your own? Two, uh, but we're separated. But not divorced? Oh, no. Oh, well, that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Uh, next time you're in town, perhaps you'd care to come and see me. I'd like to talk to you about something. Certainly. Oh, good. Here's my card. You'll find me at the TBC. Mr. Harrison. Reverend. I think you know Captain Campbell. Captain Campbell of His Majesty's ship Dorsetshire. Congratulations. Captain Campbell has been assisting me in the preliminary testing of Dr. Meyer's tables. The Reverend is making a mathematician out of me. The results are very encouraging. I've been commissioned by the Royal Society to travel to St. Helena to observe the transit of Venus. So on the way, I am to make further tests of the tables. What brings you here? We are applying for... Trial. A West Indies trial. Specified by the Act of Longitude. That's great news. And not before a time. I'd almost given up on you, Mr. Harrison. I hope you will accept my services in any way I can be of assistance. Thank you. Mr. Harrison? Gentlemen. My lords, I've come for more money. <laughs> that is your normal reason for honouring our presence, is it not, Mr. Harrison? Your lordships, my third timepiece is completed. I'm testing a fourth, which may be of great service with respect to the longitude. My son has been urging me for some time to put him to trial. I've decided to agree. 
and wish to apply to take him to the West Indies. What? A West Indies trial? You told me the machine was not even adjusted. That is what I understood, my lord, but apparently he's making a new machine. What did the board resolve? There was a suggestion that he might travel to the West Indies with the Captain John Campbell on the Dorsetshire. Oh, if he has to have a trial, it mustn't be with Captain Campbell, who is his friend. Maskell's trip to St. Helena will take four months. Harrison must not be permitted to return first. No, 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 we must find some other occupation for the Dorsetshire. With your permission, my lord. Please, carry on. Please, please, stay. Observe. I think you'll find this most interesting. This is the pineal gland. For the gland that controls our emotions. Sir. This is the first. Yes, sir. My father took it to Lisbon when I were eight years old. Beautiful. Quite beautiful. May I? Of course. Oh, remarkable. And it has kept time continuously for 24 years. Ah. And this is the second and this the third. And this is our new watch. Extraordinary. I congratulate you, Mr. Harrison. Which of these will you take to the Indies? I will take neither. I'm an old man, not fit for a long journey. Besides, I'm no sailor. My son has an enthusiasm for the sea, which I do not share. I shall send him in my stead. But you must be present for the trial. My lord, as you know, we've had difficulty in finding a ship. Mr. Campbell wished to take us, but he was ordered away on other business. The delay has, however, allowed me to continue testing my watch. I'm pleased with it. Very pleased. I shall keep the third machine here in London with me. Send the watch for test. Under the care of his son, William. Well, I hope to be of assistance. I can't promise you a captain as sympathetic as John Campbell. But I will do my best. Thank you, my lord. What is their crime? Selling alcohol. There's a rumor that the ship's beer is rotten and the men may be forced to drink water. These three were caught selling their own brew at an exorbitant price. This water so terrible. Mr. Harrison, please do not walk away. It is a requirement that punishment should be witnessed by the whole crew. Every stroke that you do not observe will be taken again. Thank you, gentlemen. This is what I mean. This is your water, sir. This is what there is for the men to drink if the beer is fouled. Mm. How do you reckon Madeira, Mr. Leonard? Two days travelling south-southwest. <sighs> Damn and blast the bloody purser. We should all have dry throats by then. I believe that, that we are closer than that, but the direction is due south. Did you speak, Mr. Harrison? Well, according to the watch, we should sight. Porto Santo at dawn tomorrow if we hold our present course to himself. I've checked the figures very carefully. What do you say, gentlemen? Mr. Harrison, I don't pretend to understand your calculations, but I'm under instruction to test your watch, and test it we damn well shall. Mr. Learmouth, hold this course until tomorrow morning. Yes, sir.
Return my compliments to the captain. I think he should come down here. Neither myself nor my officers will drink anything this evening other than the same water that is in front of you. It ain't fit for Start me. that man! I will not tolerate being interrupted when I'm speaking. Now, I am aware that what is in front of you is not the sweetest of beverages, but we have a guest on board our ship under instruction from the Admiralty. He has assured me that we will be able to take on fresh water tomorrow from Madeira. He has a machine that has made this clear to him. Is there anyone here who wishes to quarrel with Mr. Harrison's machine? Good. Then kindly get on with your meal. What time is it? Five. Not long now, then. No, sir. Look out aloft, Mr. Learmouth. They've been up there for half an hour. And the horizon? Horizon! Thank you, Mr. Learmouth. Let's put an end to this. Mr. Seward, I want all hands to quarters within the hour. Mr. Learmouth, set a new course, please, south-southwest. If there are any complaints about the delay, the men can take the matter up with Mr. Harrison. Lieutenant, just that cloud over there. You don't think it could be? Give me your glass. It seems I owe you an apology. And may I put my marker down here and now for the first watch that your father makes to go on sale to the public. You know why? Did you put it on the back seat? I think it's a good. Rupert! I think you'd better take this as well. H4, thank you very much. I'm sorry if we appeared to act a little hastily. Anyway, I'm very pleased. I feel like Jack and the Beanstalk stealing away the treasure from the giant's castle. What? Nothing. Nice motor car. Not mine, I'm afraid. Borrowed it from a chum in the RAF. I can't afford one. Of course. Are you all right? Thank you so much. Look, if there are any expenses involved, tools or whatever, make a note of them and send them to me, won't you? Thank you so much. As 
is the fact that you are about to win £20,000. You're going to be a very popular young man, Mr. Harrison. I envy you. Thank you. But I have to get back to London before I can be sure. Mr. Harrison, you are clearly not aware that while you were at sea, war was declared with Spain. Frankly, I'm surprised the Admiralty permitted you to travel to Jamaica at all. They must have known that you were likely to be stranded here. Well, there has to be a ship going back to England. No, I'm afraid not. Besides, it would be too dangerous to travel unescorted. I'm sure you wouldn't wish your watch to be captured by the Spanish. Enjoy yourself. This is a very beautiful island. Where are you going to put it? In the attic. And the job. What? You said you were going to London about a job. Oh, yes, I did. I met Uncle Mac. Uncle Mac? You don't have an Uncle Mac. I do now. He offered me a job on the wireless. You're not going to play records, are you? Not quite. <laughs> Where's the rich bastard? My dear girl, I'm the rich bastard. Perhaps you would allow me the honor of the next dance. Look over there. Who are they? They're from the Merlin. Arrived this afternoon to offload some prisoners and claim their bounty. The ships are hot, two miles sprung, and half the rigging gone. They were on their way to England when they came across a privateer. Lucky bastards. What's the name of the captain? Irish fellow, Burke. William Burke. and 12 men, not including the one who died. Good, good. Gwyneth Diaz, Harrison, we'll take you with us as long as you're ready to leave tomorrow. Tomorrow? We sail on the noon tide. Mr. Sayer! Sir. I'll need you finished up there within the hour. I have to take observations to establish the longitude of the island. Can't you wait another day? My orders say I must make sail as soon as I'm seaworthy. So, you better get on with it then. How is it? Almost there. What time do you make it? Well, the watch says. Oh, the watch. I don't need the time back in England. The mail in leaves on the noon tide. How long have I got? About an hour, I should say. I'll do the calculations later. I don't know stranded here for four months. Maskell may be on his way back from St. Helena with his lunar results. Come on. Give his hand. William. One of these chaps says he's a fisherman. He's got a boat moored on the beach below. He could take the straight out. It would save time. Are you sure? I don't think you have an option. The Merlin won't wait for you. Well, come on, then. Good luck! 
Russian. I can see you live dangerously. I like that. Welcome aboard. Thank you, Captain. I can see I'm not the only one. <laughs> Set the upper topsails, Mr. Parker. I got you. Set the upper topsails! <laughs> Have done with your summons, Mr. Harrison. Go up on deck. It's a fine sight. I cannot be certain till we're back in England. But according to my workings, you take the rate into account. We've lost under a minute since the watch left London ten weeks ago. The, uh, rate? Well, we know the watch loses two and a half seconds a day. We call that the going rate. I use that in my calculations for Madeira. Taking that into account. It's a possible error in longitude of less than half a degree. Let me be the first to congratulate you. No, thank you. I'm already drunk. All my life. My father's life. Been to this moment. Listen. If the watch stops now, sir, so does my heart. There will be no proof of its achievement. Half a degree. We won the prize, Captain. We won the prize! Captain Spaniard on the larboard side, about to cannon shot away. Every man to his station. Tell the master gunner to report to me on deck. second hand. The movement can be swung out of the case, turning on a bolt and joint, exactly as do those of ordinary watches of the period. It's no good. We're gonna have to try and outrun her. Mr. Markland, put on all the sails you can carry and set a course due east. Aye, aye, Captain. Can we get any more men aloft, Mr. Van der Weyen? We're taking a water for it. Got to keep the pumps, man, sir. Take men at the pumps at all times, taking every quarter, Mr. Hallam, and holding you responsible, yes, sir. radius and crown wheel are both very small compared with the size of the balance. But not content with this, Harrison fitted between the fourth and crown wheels a most ingenious remontoire whose action at first sight is almost uncanny. <laughs> recoil being perceptible at each beat and goes for 30 hours. The plates are of brass, polished but not gilt. 
The pivot holes are jeweled as far as the third wheel, that is to say, those are the balance, staff, detente, contract wheel, fly, fifth, fourth, and third wheels. The jewels are rubies and the end stones diamonds. It is a masterpiece, weighing only slightly less than the brain that conceived it. Arist Morning, Captain. How's your watch? Dry, sir, I think. Must be the only thing on board this ship that is. Who will believe in a naval watch that cannot survive a storm? There's many a ship that doesn't survive a storm, Mr. Harrison. But the Navy don't stop making them. It's not the Navy I have to convince, sir. It is the board of longitude. I'm very sorry, Reverend, to hear that your journey to St. Helena was unsuccessful. Unsuccessful, sir? I think you've been misinformed. A thousand miles to observe the planet Venus, and it turns out to be a cloudy day. Am I misinformed? The transit of Venus was but one part of my expedition. The lunar observations on the voyage were most interesting, as I shall explain to the board. Mr. Harrison. Mr. William Harrison. We'll go together, if you don't mind. My instructions are quite clear, sir. Don't worry. They can't hurt us. We've won. Mr. Harrison, is this your idea of a scientific observation? I must apologize, sir, but the journey back was very difficult and uh, my papers were damaged. I am referring to the fact that it appears only one observation was taken in Jamaica. No, 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 two, sir. But the second, it appears, was taken from another position. I had very little time, sir, but I can assure you the observation was most carefully taken with witnesses present as instructed by the board. Uh, Mr. Harrison, do you have any formal astronomical training? No, sir. But I have been taking observations from my father since I was six years old. Really? This is John Harrison. My lords, gentlemen, if I may beg your indulgence, it is 25 years since I first had the honor to address this board under the chairmanship of Dr. Edmund Alley. And since that time, I've worked with only one ambition, to satisfy your requirements as laid down by Act of Parliament for the discovery of longitude at sea. It is with both great pride and honor and humility that I stand here today with my son after his great trial. Thank you, Mr. Harris. May I? Thank you. Now, I have asked you here to inform you of the resolution of the board. That firstly, the brief calculations of Mr. William Harrison are to be sent for computation, and the instruments used in those observations are also to be sent for examination. The board will then consider these reports at a further meeting, the date of which will be announced in due course. That will be all for now, gentlemen. Sir, I am an old man, and an old man can sometimes find his senses unexpectedly weakened. There is perhaps an element of your argument that I have misunderstood or even misheard. My watch lost, lost one minute, 53 and a half seconds after 81 days at sea. As witness and signed in the, in the papers you have before you, which you seem so keen to put away, I have fulfilled the terms most exactly as laid down in the act of Queen Anne, and I demand 
you consider the question of my reward? Mr. Harrison, I am not a commissioner of the gaming board here to settle some bet. I am a scientist, bent on investigation of a most serious subject. Now, the board are at present unsatisfied with the information before them, but have decided to make further investigation with the help of some expert advice. Now, you will be summoned in due course to hear the results of that investigation. Any observations? On what grounds? Too few, attacking from different positions. No more necessary to make multiple observations than this to look at one's what a hundred times at the other time. We'll go to Greenwich tomorrow and start a program of experiments to prove exactly that. We shall fight them. I'm interested only in observations, not in the timekeeping of the clock. Because they are astronomers, that's all they understand. Rupert Gould, 10.30. Program? Children's Hour. You've got seven and a half minutes, which is about 1,500 words. How long is your script? I don't have a script. But you have to have a script. I have a watch. Don't worry, it'll be seven and a half minutes. Well, don't forget, at the end, say goodbye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Count to three. One, two, three. Then say goodbye. Why the pause? So the children can say goodbye back to you. I want you to close your eyes and try to think a thought that nobody else has ever thought before. Think very hard. Pay no attention to anybody else around you. What do you see? Is it just darkness? Or is there a picture? Most of us with our eyes closed just see the dark. But the artist or the scientist can sometimes see something new, something never thought of before. It's these ideas that can change our lives. And the people who think of them, whether they are musicians, painters, architects or engineers, are called inventors. Some of you listening now are inventors. Open your eyes. Look around. Can you tell who it'll be? Will it be somebody with untidy hair and big glasses? I doubt it. But new inventions often seem strange at first, even frightening. Something that seems normal to us, the clock ticking on the mantelpiece, would have seemed like a magician's trick a few hundred years ago. Mr. Harrison, we have asked you here to acquaint you with the resolutions of this board. We find that the Jamaica trial recently undertaken was not sufficient to determine the longitude at sea laid down by Act of Parliament. Yes, sir, I beg to uh, differ please with you. Let me finish, Mr. Harrison. The board therefore wishes to instigate a further trial with Mr. Harrison or some suitable individual accompanied by an astronomer approved by the board to witness the observations. Uh, gentlemen, at our last meeting, you questioned the observations taken by myself in Jamaica. Since then, I have compiled an extensive report prepared at Greenwich. Uh, please don't exert yourself, Mr. Harrison. The board has withdrawn the objections to your observations. Then why did we fail? One trial of the watch proves nothing. The results may have been chance alone. And besides, the board is not satisfied that the true longitude of Jamaica is known and feels, therefore, that a proper evaluation is impossible. But you knew that all along. May I see the results of these computers? I don't think so, do you? No, I, I'm afraid not. I mean, that would require their individual permissions, and we don't have that at the moment. Now, I must ask you, Mr. Harrison, whether you would accept the resolution of this board for a further trial accompanied by an official astronomer. The maritime museum's a marvellous idea. And the perfect place for Harrison's masterpieces. We've already written to the Science Museum to tell them that we want them back. They were not pleased, I can tell you. 
In fact, I've applied for one of the curatorships. Yes, I know. I wanted to talk to you about that. Have they considered my application? I'm afraid your application was not officially put before the committee. Why? Well, I'm not the one that decides these things, but after all that nonsense in the newspapers, it was not felt appropriate. That's it. Keep her level. That's it. There he is, she goes. Very good. Excellent. Keep coming. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Yes, of course. <clears throat> I stir. No, thank you. Ah, oh, good morning. Christopher Irwin and the Marine Chair. Oh, good morning to you, sir. Mr. John Jeffries at your service. And may I present Mr. John Harrison? The clockmaker. I'm very honoured to meet you. I take it this machine is intended for the taking of uh, lunar observations. Yes, impervious to the weather and the waves. <laughs> Sir, it's my own invention. John! Simple, yet effective, and will completely solve the problem of the longitude. I've made two, ready to sail to Barbados with the Reverend Masklin. Masklin? Yes. They said I should be here at midday. Mr. Bliss was most particular. Mr. Harrison? Oh, I can manage, Jeffries. Mr. Irwin? My lord, this is prevarication. If no astronomer is appointed, then the matter must be postponed. I humbly beg your in indulgence. Sir. We're aware that you've made various unsuccessful applications, and unsurprisingly, perhaps, no reputable man has agreed to waste his time on such an expedition. We should, therefore, move on to other matters. The Lord, I must apologize for my late arrival. Mr. Harrison, we are discussing the matter of an astronomer to accompany the trial of your father's watch. My lord, I have a proposal. Mr. Green at Greenwich. Oh, we have already covered this. Now, he did write to Mr. Green, but sadly, I spoke to him yesterday and he must decline. His recent duties at the observatory are extremely demanding. I can confirm this, my lord. I was there and Mr. Green was adamant. Lord, I've just come from Greenwich, where I had the good fortune to speak myself with Mr. Green. I trust, Mr. Harrison, it's not your intention to question the word of two members of this board. No, my lord. But Mr. Green has kindly agreed to accompany me here. No, I certainly have never seen anything like it. Most extraordinary. It stays completely upright in any weather. I see. Mr. Green. What are you doing here? I'm not exactly sure, Reverend. It has been a most confusing morning. Christopher Irwin, the Marine Chair. Mr. Green. Excuse me. You wouldn't by any chance be the Reverend Masculine. What? My name is Christopher Irwin, and this is the Marine, Marine Chair. Chair. Yes, I think I'd gathered that. So, in principle, Mr. Green, you would be prepared to accompany the expedition. Yes, uh, but... But uh, what you are saying, I think, is that you would require permission from your superior. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, perhaps my colleagues and I could help you with that. Dr. Bliss, who exactly is Mr. Green's superior? You know perfectly well he works for me at the observatory. Then if you were to remove your objection, the matter may be settled. My lords, I believe the Reverend Neville Masculine would be a more suitable observer. His presence on the trial would allow us to test the lunar data he is compiling. I have here a copy of his new publication, The British Mariner's Guide. It contains an entry for the position of the moon at every day of every hour for the next three years. It enables with observation, the calculation at sea of the longitude. Very well, my lord. I propose that both Mr. Green and Mr. Masculine go. Can we all agree on that? 
then the matter is settled. I think there may be one or two other points to clarify. We would like to see six equal altitude observations per day for three consecutive days. Impossible. You cannot get six observations a day at Greenwich, let alone the West Indies. Captain Campbell. He's right, my lord. Let it read as many as are practical. Very well. For as many as are practical. The watch must be submitted to me at the observatory for testing to determine its rate before the second trial. I'm not letting the watch out of my sight. We need to determine the rate. Captain Campbell, enlighten us. My lord, I think the rate should be determined by whoever is closest to the instrument, which must be Harrison. Provided that it is disclosed before the voyage starts, there is no possibility of dissimulation. We believe that the Reverend Masklin should travel on a different ship than the Harrison so that he may have more time to set up his instruments for the observation of Jupiter's moons. Agreed. Agreed. Gentlemen, the Reverend Masculine will be in Barbados one month before you and will have everything prepared for your arrival. It remains for us to wish you every success aboard His Majesty's ship, Tata. Yeah. successful voyage. Well, I would like to take another observation don't mind, just to be sure. Indeed. Captain Lindsay. Certainly. Ah. <laughs> Mr. Irwin, just in time to witness our observation. Ah. We were expecting you to meet us. Uh, no one told us that you had arrived. And the transmission of information is not a strong point among the inhabitants of this island, I'm afraid. How is the voyage? Very satisfying. Where is masculine? Well, the man's an idiot. Could you hold this a moment? Uh, yes, of course. He has no understanding of my chair. Simply because a hinge broke on the second day out, causing him some very minor inconvenience, he's completely refused to use it. I mean, what sort of a scientist does that make him? 23 degrees of elevation. And the watch at uh, 357. That gives us a longitude of 59 degrees, 0 minutes and 30 seconds. Captain Lindsay, would you be kind enough to give me your signature, sir? Is that it? What do you mean? Is that all you do? I'm sorry to disappoint you, Mr. Raymond. What did you expect? Mr. Green, would you care to witness? Oh, of course, Mr. Harrison. Well, the Reverend Masculine spends half the day calculating his sums, and with a good deal of bad temper besides. I have once or twice offered to help being uh, something of a mathematician myself, and have been most rudely addressed by him. It's lunatics for you. You'll find him very confident. Of what? That the longitude solution is found. Apparently, he was very annoyed that it was not recognized after the voyage to Santa Lima. But he's convinced it is his now. He's told half the island. As a result of which, he's followed everywhere by the three unwed ladies of the town and their mothers, who are convinced he is to be rich. He doesn't seem to notice, though. I don't think he's very uh, interested. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it is a hard life, I admit, but I find myself enjoying it. No, there's no more training required whatsoever. I mean, anyone who sat down before can use it. 
Well, don't miss anyone. Thank you. I'd expected to see the Reverend Masculine here. Send his apologies. Thank you. He's at his observatory. It's out there in the hills, outside the town. He's expecting to see you tomorrow morning. You must be very proud to be part of his expedition. I beg your pardon? Madam, Mr. Harrison intends to challenge the reverend gentleman not to support him. He is his competitor. Oh, dear. How silly of me. Congratulations on a safe trip. Welcome to this island paradise. Good morning. I was sorry to miss your dinner last night. Those things become a little predictable after a while. Such a perfect night. I understand it is you who is to be congratulated. Really? You know, everyone at dinner last night informed me you'd won the Longitude Prize. You should not take talk like that seriously, Mr. Harrison. I wouldn't. Would it not for the fact that the talk apparently came from you, Reverend? Under the circumstances, I think it would be improper that you take the equal altitude observations that will determine the accuracy of my watch. And I would prefer them to be taken by Mr. Green here and witnessed by Captain Lindsay. How dare you say that to me, sir? I am a scientist. Oh, dear boy, I don't think he meant... Oh, shut up, you stupid, stupid man. Uh, gentlemen, could I suggest a compromise? Blast this bloody contraption. It's impossible to take a measurement properly under these circumstances. 28 degrees and 15 minutes. 28 degrees and 15 minutes. 28 degrees, 15 minutes. Would you be quiet? I'm so sorry to have disturbed you. We are quite finished. Look, old man, why don't you make another observation tomorrow? I'm sure the conditions will be better. We'd lost you. I think perhaps you have. You know, today is the first day I can remember when I haven't looked at a clock or a watch or even done a calculation. <laughs> I didn't know what to do at first. And I just started to walk. What is it? Bad news, I'm afraid. I found you a ship. He's a merchantman. The captain's name is Robert Manley. He's a good fellow. And uh, she sails at noon tomorrow. What are you doing? Sell the house, I suppose. There's no choice about that. I can't afford to keep it. Well, where will you live? Oh, I'll find somewhere. A small hotel. What about the clocks? I don't suppose a hotel would put up with them. There's only one left, you'll be pleased to hear. It's proving to be a bit tricky. I'm sending it back to Greenwich. I'll finish working on it there. Oh, yes, Cecil said you'd applied for a job as a curator. No, no, I, uh... I changed my mind about that. Well, goodbye then. Goodbye. Laura says there's going to be a war. What do you think? I don't think so. 
It's all family. Thank you so much for coming. It's a great pleasure. How was he? Very weak. He's angry with himself that he could not be there to greet you. He received your letters. How long has it been like this? Since you left. Try not to get him excited. The fever is strong. I have bled him again, but he's very weak and I dare do no more. I'll come back tomorrow. Thank you. Sorry, I wasn't there to meet you. Never mind about that. We did it. Mr. Green was there and witnessed everything. Even masculine can't deny it. This time, they can't refuse us. <laughs> I'd like to see their faces when you tell them. Still, there is one piece of news. The very Reverend John Bliss had the misfortune to fall off his horse whilst taking exercise in the park. He did not recover. It's devastating, isn't it? Who is to be Astronomer Royal? Not decided yet. Mr. William Harrison. Mr. Harrison, you may have heard of the sad death of the Astronomer Royal in your absence. Yes, sir. I'd like to take this opportunity to present the new Astronomer Royal. Good morning, William. The Reverend Neville Maskelin, recently returned from a most successful trip to the West Indies. <laughs> the members of the board will be familiar, I think, with his report and the astonishing success he had on his journey and the triumphant use of Professor Meyer's tables my lord, I'm sure I also must congratulate the Reverend Masculine, but as we all know, the calculation with the watch may be completed in a matter of minutes and does not depend upon the weather. Be quiet, Mr. Harrison. We are coming now to the matter of the watch and the opinion of the computers. Captain Campbell, you attest that this is your report and that you and your colleagues agree on it? We do. Very well. Mr. Harrison, please step forward. It is the finding of this board that the watch or timepiece created by John and William Harrison did keep correct time within the greatest accuracy required by the act of Queen Anne as drawn up by Parliament 51 years ago. Well, Lord, may I have a copy of those to show my father? He has waited a long time to hear your Lordship's kind words. In good time, Mr. Harrison. Astronomer Royal, would you be kind enough to read the fifth paragraph of the Act? My Lord. And be it further enacted by the authority aforesaid, that as soon as such method for the discovery of the said longitude shall have been tried and found practicable and useful at sea. Thank you. Practicable and useful. Those are the words I wish to draw to your attention. We accept the usefulness of the watch 
But is it practicable? Mr. Harrison himself has never permitted this committee to examine the workings of his timepiece. I suggest to you that is because he himself has doubt about the practical use of his invention. Well, Lords, you must understand that my father has sought to protect his work from those who might steal his inventions. But if this board requires it, we shall submit detailed drawings of the workings of the watch when he has received his prize. Mr. Harrison, this board does not accept restrictions placed upon its work as prescribed by Parliament. Here are the conditions required for fulfilment of the terms of the Act. First, your father must, in person, take the watch apart and explain the working of every detail to the complete satisfaction of such persons as this board shall appoint. This shall include any experimental observations they may require. Secondly, he shall make, or cause to be made under his sole direction, two further watches of the same design to demonstrate the practicality of their construction. And thirdly, these new watches shall be subjected to such test or tests as this board shall require to ascertain their usefulness under the terms of the Act. Then, and only then, will he receive his prize. Oh Lord, my father is sick and he's 73 years old. He has until Thursday to accept the conditions, which I must inform you have been submitted to Parliament and will form part of a new amendment to this bill. Call Mr. Christopher Irwin, please. My lord, if I may beg your indulgence, I'm not yet used to speaking. I must still speak for me. Perhaps your father would like a chair. Oh, thank you. No, thank you. Well, let us proceed to the business. You accept the terms of the board? My father accepts the need for disclosure of the working of his watch, but wishes that he might demonstrate the mechanism to such people as may understand it, not to uh, theorists. That is for us to decide. And choose who they like. I'll choose who I let in my own house. I beg pardon, Mr. Harrison. My father is pleased to accept the board's nominations. There is one question. Your lordship requires that we be prepared to do experimental observations. Uh, my father is not clear what that means. Well, it, it, it. Reverend Maskell. Um, th there's nothing sinister about it, merely that if there is a detail not understood by the committee, such as um, how Mr. Harrison is accustomed to, um, what's the word, uh, um, temper a spring, for example, he should demonstrate his technique to us. What does he understand about the tempering of a bloody spring? Would it be possible to set out more explicitly what the board requires so that we might be prepared for it? No, sir! It would not! 
It is not your business, sir, to limit the inquiry of this board, but to satisfy it. It is not my business, sir, to explain the workings of a lifetime to a group of dog-collared university book swallowers who wouldn't know the difference between a balanced spring and a bent at pen. The 30 years I've stood before this board, I never once had the occasion to talk to anyone who knew anything about what I was actually doing, any sense of the mechanisms I created. But I carried on, trusting that if I fulfilled the act of Queen Anne, I'd get my just rewards. I have fulfilled that act. I have made such a mechanism. Give me my prize and I'll use the money to build a, a factory, make hundred watches, a thousand, each one the same. But I will not, as long as I've got a drop of English blood in my body, and not dance to the tune of a group of ignorant schoolboys. Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison! Father, oh, don't give me any more of your fine words and clever explanations. What do you know about what I've had to put up with? What do you understand about what I've done? Could you build a watch, sir? No. Get down well from Get away from me. Get away from me. William. William. If you wouldn't mind. Mr. Harrison, either your father signs an oath agreeing to these terms, or this matter ends here. We are prepared to pay half the award, less those monies paid out, once we are satisfied with the disclosure, and the other half when the new watches made by your father have proved their worth. My lord, if you would just change the wording of experimental observations, he would, he would sign. No! 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 How many times do I have to say it to you bloody people? You do not! Negotiate with this board! I'm 40 years old. And what family I have is here in this room. These machines are my brothers and sisters. Certainly I know them better than any human. So do you. Ever since I was a child, I've watched out carefully you touch them. Never angry. Always loving. Nothing I could ever do could make your eyes light up in the way an infinitesimal sliver of time could sometimes make you weep with joy. So I try to slide myself between them and you, hoping that some tiny drop of that feeling might fall on me. As I grew older, I thought, if I can understand them, perhaps you would begin to understand me. Until they became my life too. And so I find myself now, knowing the touch of a brass wheel, better than flesh and blood. I will do as they wish. I wanted you to be 
same. I thought I could make us impregnable. Exhibits out to Cambridge. Why on earth would Hitler buy a museum in the middle of a park? It's just orders. Oh, just orders. I heard that. Do you mind if I do that? There's a special case for it. I made it myself some time ago, but I'm sure I can still find it. Help yourself. It's a funny looking thing, isn't it? Yes, it is a funny looking thing. Do you think I could have a chair? Thank you. Look, uh, are you all right? No, I don't think I am. How old are you? 18. Although I don't know what that's got to do with it. Nothing, nothing at all. Don't take any notice of me. It's just... Do you have any idea what it's like? War? Mm. Is that what you're worried about? It'll all be over before it begins. Germany don't want a war. It's just their way of waking us all up. Look, can I get you something? A cup of tea? Yes. A cup of tea. That'll do the trick. Suggesting is that they can go to different destinations, and if one of them is destroyed, the others will survive. Is that possible? Well, look, I'll do my best, but at the moment, it's all I can do to get everything over to Cambridge. Oh, we are sending some of the smaller items to a science museum vault in Beckenham. I could try yes, and get one. Beckenham will be good, thank you. Right, well, no, leave I've it with me, to, please, and I'll to. sort something out. Thank you very much.
all satisfied. Now we just put the watch together and take it to the committee. He'll give us half the prize. What watch? There is no watch. Look at it! strange thing is, I want to build another one, taking it apart and putting it together again. I can see improvements. You have to make a duplicate. Those were the terms. Terms? What do they know? It wasn't one of them who understood what I was saying. Even the watchmakers didn't see everything. They think in straight lines, are prepared for the curve, line of surprise that takes you to a place you cannot see. Hmm. And how are we to know that this is the same watch that was used at the disclosure? If I could make a watch in five days, then I'd have the prize money by the end of the week. Very well. I am pleased to offer you the certificate of this board. Congratulations. You've made something useful. How long will it take you to make two further watches as required by the Act? The new Act. Beg pardon, sir? Additional instruments are not required by the Act of Queen Anne. The Act required that the invention be practical. We have merely clarified that issue in our recent amendment. How long will it take? Two years, if my watch is returned to me to work on. I'm afraid that is impossible. Your watch, as you call it, is of course our watch. And this board intends, under the direction of the Astronomer Royal, to conduct a series of tests at the observatory in Greenwich, at the conclusion of which Mr. Larkin Kendall will make a copy of the watch, and I think you will agree his need is the greater. It will take a further year if I'm forced to work without it. So be it, Mr. Harrison. So be it. Thank you. Mr. Harrison, I have instructed the Astronomer Royal to collect the rest of the timepieces. Why? Because they are the property of this board. suspension. It means to destroy them on the journey to Greenwich. Morning, William. I've come to collect some fun. Mr. Harrison. Reverend Maston. The machines are ready for collection. I will need a certificate from you that they're in good order. I'm not sure I'm a good judge of that, sir. Of course, I agree with you. I can state that they appear to be in good order. I think that will suffice. I can state as a fact they're in perfect order. That will not be necessary. And I will need it to be understood that when they left my property, that was the case. And that you were entirely responsible for their safety from this moment on. I accept that responsibility. Now, what is their normal method of transport? Boat. Do not bandy words with me, sir. I am serious. They should go to Greenwich by barge. Not some old cart like a butcher would carry a bag of bones in. I merely wish to know whether it is the custom to take machines to pieces before moving them. No. But they must Look, all... Enough, enough. He has the authority of the board. Let him exercise it. Quite childish. I know perfectly well how to achieve this. If this is the case, we will need a, a, a blacksmith to help us take it apart.
Your father has been cruelly used. But while I'm out of the Admiralty, there is little I can do. But there must be some other way. He cannot finish two further watches, it will kill him. Do you have any skill at cards, Mr. Harrison? No, my lord. No. Neither do these ladies, it would appear. Perhaps they flatter me. <laughs> well, Parliament has already been the instrument of much mischief. There is, therefore, only one court of appeal I could recommend. And that is? The Crown. Look at what? Your watch. Sit up. Down you go. I took mine away. Here you are. Mind you, look after it or you'll get me into trouble. Thank you. It will be quite informal. Just bow and address him as Your Majesty. I will divert the Queen, whose taste is more inclined to scandal than to science. Saved. Lord Sandwich knows about the running of the ship. He will come to our rescue. Your Majesty, may I present Mr. John Harrison? Mr. Harrison, I am very pleased to make your acquaintance. Please excuse our exuberance. Mr. William Harrison. Uh, have you ever sailed on a frigate, sir? I have, Your Majesty. And where, pray, were the mortars situated? On the forecastle deck. Aha! Georgie, you are in the right, sir, and I am in the wrong. Mr. Harrison here will show you the positioning of your mortars. You may need some more ammunition. My dear, you mustn't get the children so excited. They'll never sleep. Or hide. Sie sehen sehr gut aus. Sie schmeicheln mir wie immer, my lord. Mr. Harrison, I think I have something here that might interest you. Please excuse my husband. Come and look at our battleships, Mama. May I come aboard? <laughs> this was presented to me by Mr. Priestley. The most wonderful creation for the production of electricity. And what is its use? The haven't the foggiest, but that's pretty what? What? <laughs> Mr. Harrison, I've been informed at length about your trials, and I must tell you, sir, that we are very disturbed by the news. The safety of our ships is our dearest concern, and we are most grateful for your endeavours on their behalf. Thank you, Your Majesty. Tell me, have you started work on the new watch? I have, sir. When it is finished, will you do something for me? Bring it here, let me see it. I would be most interested. Oh, have you seen this? I wore it today, especially for you. Mr. Arnold made it for me. Papa, come and see our mortars. Blown up your sandwich. I hope not. The Admiralty may want him back. So do I get my watch back then? I'm not sure I can do without it yet. Have you had a walk today? Oh. I'm getting you up. Do you have a name? 
Rupert. Do you? Grace. It is nursing Grace to you. There's nothing to be alarmed about. It's only a drill. the story you were telling me yesterday about him taking the watch to the king. Did he? Yes. He did. The king decided to do his own experiment. An experiment that lasted months. Did it work? No, not at the beginning. At the beginning, it was a disaster. It is a most perplexing matter. Dr. Domain Bray, my astronomer and dear friend, came to me this morning with the news. Well, I can tell you, sir, that I did not believe it. He came here at once to see for myself. And he was right. Absolutely and utterly correct. I don't know what to make of it. You don't understand what was wrong. Wrong? What? Was it slow? Did it stop? Oh, what that it had, sir? What? No, the problem is more serious than that. Your watch, sir, your watch, sir, is going backwards. Position, I believe, is correct. The position is fine. I have no explanation for this. Wait. What? The compass needles. What do you think? The needles? When we were magnetizing the needles, what do we do with the... whatever you call it? What? The lodestones. Where's the key? The key. Quick, man, quick, check your whiskey. Ah. Lodestones. You think the magnets were affecting the clock? I am sure of it, sir. Take these out and throw them in the garden. Immediately. There. Now we must start all over again. Your Majesty is very kind. Piffle, sir. I'm a scientist. Five, fifty-six, fifty-seven, fifty-eight, fifty-nine, eleven o'clock. Well, let me see, Mr. Harrison. I think we are on target, gentlemen. Good. Getting the hang of it now.
January, February. We're going to kick you out soon, you know. Well, they can't possibly. I'm feeling particularly mad at the moment. I don't think they cure that kind of madness here. What will you do? I don't know. Fix a tent outside the gates, I suppose. Do you have any objections to life under canvas? Not more than a couple of thousand. Mm. Seriously, though. Seriously, though. I've no idea. It's just... you could move in with me. What, in the nurse's quarters? Wouldn't Sister object, or do you imagine I wear some sort of disguise? Don't be silly. It doesn't suit you. No, I'm thinking about going home. Before they throw me out, too. My mother needs some help, and I feel I ought to be with her. It's not ideal, I know, but... You could come too, if you wanted. Sounds pretty ideal to me. They've had hundreds of proofs. What makes you think one more will change their mind? Well, they must listen to the king. And there is one thing in our favour. <laughs> Lord Morton is deceased. <laughs> <laughs> I move to enter the results of the recent trial at the King's Observatory in Richmond, which show that in a trial of 70 days, greater than the time of the West Indies voyage stipulated in the act of Queen Anne, the watch lost less than a tenth of a second a day, which would be consistent with finding a longitude in those West Indies to a distance of less than one mile and therefore wholly within the act. Sir, this board, this board cannot accept an unsupervised trial, no matter how eminent the participants may have been. This board is charged by a most solemn act of Parliament, as these members are here to witness, and must satisfy its observations by its own eyes and not those of any other party. The royal trial was carried out under the strictest conditions, with three separate key holders, His Majesty graciously consenting to be one of them. The regulating clock was a subject of nine observations of the sun to keep a check on its accuracy. Something the Astronomer Royal never attempted once during his own trial. Sit down, Mr. Harrison. I would like to call upon Captain John Campbell, who has a report recently arrived from Jamaica concerning the exploratory voyage of His Majesty's ship Resolution under the command of Captain James Cook. Captain. Gentlemen, mm -hmm. Captain Cook is carrying a copy of Mr. Harrison's timekeeper made by Mr. Kendall and the um, astronomical tables of the Reverend Maskelyne. His full report will not be available until his return, but I am able to read you this extract from his log. It would not be doing justice to Mr. Harrison and Mr. Kendall if I did not own that we have received very great assistance from this useful and valuable timepiece. The watch was used to predict the landfall of St. Helena within three miles. This is not evidence, but anecdote. This board, under the direction of the late Lord Morton, made its conditions perfectly clear. When Mr. Harrison has completed work on his second copy, both watches will be subjected to a trial of several months on land and at sea with the utmost rigor. No other test will suffice. If you will excuse me, I have an important matter I must attend to. Mr. Harrison, if your business is finished here, perhaps you would care to accompany me. With the board's permission. I want to thank the board for giving me the opportunity to make a second copy of my watch. It is not often that a father is permitted to revisit the childhood of a much-loved child, as 
I've been allowed to. And on that journey, find a new respect and love for that child. I can beg your indulgence, my lord Chips. I'm an old man, and I've never been accounted a speaker of merit. I may not be spared to complete another watch, but I've begun one. It will not, gentlemen, be a copy, because I am mindful of the act of Queen Anne, to which I've clung for over 50 years, like a, like a shipwrecked sailor to a barrel, to be practical. In all my life, that's been my gospel and my creed. I have an idea that the heat compensation must be within the balance of the watch and not around it. And this morning, I made this. I tried the idea in my first seat clock over 40 years ago. I failed. I didn't understand it. So much I didn't understand it. A compensating balance wheel will simplify the adjustment of the machine so others may make my watches more easily. Should God grant me the time to complete my labors. Thank God you're here. Hurry, please. The producer's having kittens. But I thought the program started at eight. This is television, Commander. We have rehearsals. I'll have to take you straight to makeup. Oh, is all this absolutely necessary? Having constructed a timekeeper, from which discovery... John Harrison never received his award from the Board of Longitude. It came to him by special act of Parliament when he was 80 years old. ...to pay or cause to be paid to the said John Harrison. That sum long promised to him by this house as a reward. He had a further two years left to him to enjoy his wealth. After his death in 1776, William married, but never made another watch. After the war, Rupert Gould became a regular member of the Brains Trust, a popular panel show, and appeared several times on television. What makes a man great? A man may be great in his aims, or in his achievements, or in both, but I think that man is truly great, who makes the world his debtor, who does something for the world which the world needs, and which nobody before him has done or known how to do. John Harrison was such a man. In 1946, Gould was finally made a curator of the National Maritime Museum. And a year later, he was awarded the gold medal of the British Horological Institute. He died in 1948. And even today, there is not a seaman alive anywhere whose track is not made straighter, safer, and more prosperous by the possession of a timekeeper. Gould's notebooks are displayed today at the Royal Observatory. Next to them stand John Harrison's four marine timepieces which together represent one man's struggle against all odds to use the fourth dimension, time, to connect positions on our three-dimensional globe. Thanks to Harrison's work and others, Greenwich is recognized all over the world as the prime meridian, the longitude zero by which all time and space is measured from one millennium to the next.